Welcome back to the channel. Listeners will know that recently I've been doing a lot of traveling, going to places like Wash U, St. Louis, Stanford, and beyond. And one of the talks I gave is the talk that I'm going to give to you right now. It's a debate proposition. It's one side of the debate. And here's the proposition. People who feel sick should no longer get a COVID-19 test, even though they may have COVID-19 and could spread it to people where they work or go to school. It's a loaded proposition. My answer, of course, is yes, this is true. If you feel sick, stay home. If you feel healthy, go to school, go to work, and you don't need anything more complicated than that. You can take all those tests and throw them in the trash can where they belong. And here's my argument why that's the case. Number one, people around the world agree with me. They don't agree with the opposite position. Here's Denmark, who should be tested for COVID-19. De testing is no longer recommended for the majority of the population. Public testing was closed in April of 2023. They do recommend that people at high risk of severe disease do get tested, and that's because of Paxlovid, which we'll come back to if that actually does anything of value. Norway. Norway agrees with me. You do not need to test for COVID-19, even if you experience respiratory symptoms, unless you are in the high-risk group. And again, high-risk because Paxlovid. We'll come back to Paxlovid. The U.S. CDC, of course, once again, a global outlier, not falling in line with our peer nations. They say, if you have any COVID-19 symptoms, test immediately. And that's a bizarre recommendation. Why they say that is that if you test positive for COVID-19, their guidance, stay home for five days and isolate from others. You're most infectious in the first five days. So let's compare the two different recommendations. My recommendation, if you feel sick, stay home. And if you feel well, go out, go to work. My recommendation's in line with most of Europe. Let's take the opposite position. If you feel sick, test yourself for COVID-19, isolate for five days or until the test is no longer positive. And if you feel sick and you test negative for COVID-19, there's actually no guidance that they're giving you. Let's compare these two worlds. On the left, this is my world. Every person here represents two people out of a hundred percent of the population. This is the Niprasad in Europe. And on the right is the US CDC. Based on the CDC's own statistics at any given time, approximately 8% of the population is having an upper respiratory tract infection, symptoms of URI. Based on current rates, about 10% of those people have COVID-19. In my world on the left, the people in the box all feel sick. They're going to stay home. In the world on the right, the people in the box, the CDC is going to have them test. And a bunch of people are going to test negative, and some people are going to test positive for COVID-19. So this is assuming that it's a perfect test. This is assuming that everyone is doing exactly what they're supposed to. Let's think about these people. Now I've scaled it up to a hypothetical 10 people who, are who have upper respiratory tract symptoms. One of them is going to have COVID-19 and not know it in my world because they're not being tested. The other nine are going to have something like metanumovirus, rhinovirus, you know, influenza. In my world, all of these people are going to stay home when they're sick. The person with COVID-19 is probably going to stay home around seven days because that's the average duration of symptoms currently. And the other people are going to stay home when they're feeling sick. In the CDC's world, that one person's going to get tested. They're going to know they have COVID-19. They're going to stay home a little bit less, maybe five days. And what about the other nine people? What do they do? And their recommendation hinges on what those other nine people do. And here's what some people say they do. A student showed up in my lab hacking and coughing with a surgical mask on. I asked, I asked if she's sick. She said, yes, that's why she's wearing the mask. I said, next time I'll cover her duties that day and she should stay home. In other words, those people might actually be empowered to go out and spread the virus, a different virus, or even COVID-19. We'll come back to that. This is what a colleague told me. This colleague was feeling very sick. And this colleague had a COVID-19 test, despite the fact that I've been saying you don't need to test. This colleague said, quote, I'm embarrassed to admit that I, had a test, that I tested for COVID-19 because if I were negative, I had planned to wear a mask and go to clinic. In other words, the test itself can actually propagate respiratory viruses due to unanticipated behavioral change. The whole strategy hinges on what those nine people do, and they may alter their behavior in ways that actually accelerate the spread of respiratory viruses in the winter season, including COVID-19, which we're going to come back to. So we have no idea if the current CDC strategy of testing if you feel sick actually makes more people or less people less sick in the winter season. We don't know. And that's the problem. The test companies have the obligation to show us. So what we really need is a randomized control trial where we randomize people to the strategy of testing or not. And there are many ways you could do it. I won't bore you with that for this video. There can be cluster designs. There can be individual randomized trials. But the test manufacturers have a duty to show us under what circumstances the test can improve outcomes. Otherwise, it's just testing that might actually make the situation worse. Now, consider the reality that the test is not perfect. It is not a perfect test. It doesn't always find COVID if you got COVID. It doesn't always exclude COVID if you don't have COVID. Let's look at the test characteristics. This is 
based on the most recent Cochrane review, this is the rapid point of care antigen testing for SARS-CoV-2. This is what most people are using. And this is what Cochrane says. The average sensitivity in symptomatic people is 73%. And the average sensitivity in asymptomatic people is 54%. So let's take those numbers and let's think about a hypothetical 100 people walking around right now with COVID-19. There are two worlds. These are not my worlds. This is one world is on the left. This is a world where we do what the CDC says. Anybody who feels sick is going to get tested. These are 100 people with COVID-19 sitting in the population. The world on the right is a strategy where we test everybody all the time. Feel sick, feel well. We're just going to keep testing you relentlessly. Based on the test characteristics, this is what's going to happen. In the world on the left, all of those people in the box, that 40% of people, those are people who have COVID-19. They feel nothing. They're asymptomatic. The CDC strategy of testing is not going to catch any of those people. They're going to go around spreading COVID-19. On the left, all the yellow people are the people you're going to pick up with COVID-19. But those people who are black in that space on the left side of the figure, those are people who are going to have symptomatic COVID-19, be falsely told they don't, and might even propagate it more, for all you know. In the world on the right, even if you test everybody, you see there are many, many people we're missing with COVID-19, even if we tested all the asymptomatic people all the time. So the problem with this idea of testing is it's no panacea. Among 100 people with COVID-19, 56 of them will be missed with a just test sick people testing strategy. 42 will be missed with a testing sick and healthy people strategy. Most people are going to be walking around spreading COVID-19 unknowingly. Whether you test them if they're sick or test them every day, they're just going to spread it. There's nothing you can do to stop the spread of this respiratory virus. It's a fool's errand to think you would. Now let's take a broader view. Let's think about the whole world. Let's think about the world. There are 8 billion people on this planet. 331 million live in America. That's 4% of the population. 7.6 billion people live in a low and middle income country. The people, 85% of the population living in those countries, they can't afford testing. They're not going to test. They're never going to test one day in their life going forward. Testing is never going to affect those populations, okay? So what's going to happen? The average person in the world interacts with 12 other people per day. On any given day, we have 100 billion person-to-person -person interactions, and that's 100 trillion interactions since the pandemic began, person-to-person -person interactions, and the global testing market is about a billion tests. So at best, we're testing one in 100,000 human interactions. You have to be out of your mind to think that testing such a paucity of human interactions is going to have anything to do with the spread of this virus or variants or anything like that. It doesn't protect anybody. The virus is just going to circulate around the planet. You have to be deluded to think it's going to do anything in this ocean of human interactions, this tiny sliver of testing. And by the way, most people are not going to test because most people don't believe the CDC anymore because the CDC has been selling us a steady stream of falsehoods. So testing companies have made billions of dollars and they have a medical and moral obligation to show under what circumstances testing can improve outcomes. They have never, ever demonstrated in any randomized study that a routine strategy of testing any population, any setting can lead to better health outcomes. That is a colossal failure when you think about how much money we've been stuffing into their pockets from the government coffers. Biden administration just gave them another $600 million. Does the Biden administration want to be a steward of taxpayer money or do they just want to get their friends rich who are in the companies? I don't know. They've spent $4 billion on tests since the pandemic began. We're spending billions and billions and these corporations have never shown under what circumstances their tests improve outcomes. People who are the most prominent proponents of testing, such as this gentleman who worked at Harvard University, quickly joined the exodus into the testing gold mill, and this person now works at a company that makes those tests. So we have conflicts of interest that are rampant in this space. Of course, the test makers want to sell their useless tests that have never been shown to improve human outcomes and might even make things worse with false information and compensatory behavior. So the problems with testing everyone are, one, most people are not going to follow this advice, so there's non-adherence. I haven't even modeled non-adherence, but that makes all of the things I've showed you look worse. The test has imperfect test characteristics. No matter how much you test everybody, you will miss most cases of COVID-19, and you can only test a tiny sliver of the billions of people who live in the world and the 100 billion interactions a day. So it's delusional to think you're going to put a dent in this tsunami of COVID spread that's going to circulate for the next 100,000 years. You don't know if behavior has changed favorably. In fact, there may be these Peltzman effect or compensatory behavioral change where people who test negative falsely or people who have a different URI are actually empowered to spread that more. You're better off by telling people to stay home when they feel sick. 
And in the grand scheme of the world, COVID-19 is a forest fire. And all this is doing is like having the arrogance to walk out on your lawn when the forest fire is raging towards your house. You pour a glass of water on your lawn and you're like, hmm, maybe that's going to help. It's not going to help. It's just going to waste that glass of water. Conclusion, it's unlikely this policy affects the spread of the virus. And it's possibly this policy actually exposes more vulnerable people to some respiratory virus. Only randomized studies can adjudicate that. The companies don't want to do any, and their cronies in government don't want to make them do any. They'd rather just hand them billions of dollars, and I have a problem with that. But testing people allows us to give Paxlovid to the high-risk people. That's what the, governs, the, the governments of Europe think, just, just test the high risk. Let's look at the evidence for Paxlovid, which is another government giveaway to Pfizer. We wrote about it, Milos and I, in the American Journal of Medicine. We call it Paxlovid, a regulatory gamble. And Todd Lee and colleagues wrote about it. What is the place for Paxlovid therapy? Of course, the situation with COVID-19 has changed dramatically. This comes from the Financial Times. This is showing you the infection fatality rate over time. Again, seasonal influenza from 2020 to the vaccination of vulnerable groups, boosters, and then population immunity and less lethal variant strains. And what you see now is that COVID-19 is no more lethal than the flu. It's in the same ballpark as seasonal influenza. The literature, the evidence, the randomized evidence for Paxlovid is very, very negative in the era that we're in, the Omicron era, the low IFR era. The best study that we have published to date is the Epic SR study, the only randomized control trial in people who had at least gotten some vaccination. And this is a Paxlovid, no Paxlovid in the people who have been vaccinated. And this shows absolutely no improvement in symptom resolution or hospitalization. It is a negative study. The confidence intervals from minus 44% to 83%. It is a stone cold negative study. The only positive study is Epic HR. Here, I'm going to show you all of the randomized control trials of Molnupiravir and Paxlovid. And I'm going to show you it against all of the strains. It's going to tell you a really great story. Okay, let's walk through it. On the upper left, I show you the peaks of the pandemic. Below it in orange, gray, blue, and yellow, I've labeled the prevailing strains. We have alpha, we have beta, we have delta, we have omicron. Here I've listed every single randomized control trial that's ever been conducted of Paxlovid and Molnupiravir. And what do I want to show you? And here in the blue line, I'm showing you the increasing seroprevalence of prior COVID-19 in the population going up over time. So what do you see here? Well, you see that the positive randomized control trial, Epic HR for Paxlovid, occurred in the setting of unvaccinated people who were at high risk of having COVID-19, who had not had COVID-19 before. And it occurred during the Delta wave. That's the positive trial, Epic HR. The positive trial for Molnupiravir occurred also during the Delta wave right here. But in Molnupiravir's case, we have a massive randomized control trial called Panoramic, which is stone cold negative once Omicron took over. And by the way, we have to make decisions for today, not the past. We're making decisions going forward. Molnupiravir appears not to do anything of value in the Omicron setting with, the, with high population immunity. The Epic SR study is negative in people who've been vaccinated and with high population immunity. This small Chinese study is a negative study. That's what red means, negative, negative. And then the biggest ongoing study, Panoramic, is dragging on, on and on and on, very likely to be negative. But Paxlovid and Molnupiravir appear to have no credible evidence supporting their use in the Omicron era, in people who are vaccinated or boosted, and with high population immunity. In other words, they have no credible evidence for the current clinical situation we're facing. And if you superimpose the IFR dropping over time, this story just gets stronger. No credible evidence. Here I've shown you the actual raw counts. The rightmost is Epic HR, where you can see a little bit of a difference. But the other are the other Paxlovid studies. And these studies are just, you can't even see the difference. I mean, they're very, very small. The baseline rates of hospitalization have been floored. Todd Lee and colleagues estimated that it would cost about $112,000 to prevent one hospitalization. And then if I use Epic SR numbers, um, I get about $135,000 to avoid a hospitalization. That's going to be not cost-effective assuming it would be positive, which is an unfair assumption because it's probably not positive, but that's not cost-effective in any society on earth, even if you believed it worked. What about observational data? People are going to come back and say, you're just focusing on the randomized trials, but what about this great observational data? Well, this observational data is complete bullshit, and I'll show you that so simply. You, 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 once you see it, you can't unsee it. So this is one of the observational studies people hang their hat on for Omicron. It's got these two figures showing you if you get Paxlovid treatment on the top, you do so much better than if you don't, sorry, if you get Paxlovid on, on the top, you do so much better, the blue line, than if you get no treatment. And the same for Molnupiravir, that they both work really well in Omicron. And the hazard ratios are 0.14 and 0.37. These are just game-changing products. 
But what's the problem here? One, if you compare the molnar pirivir observational study to the randomized trial panoramic at done at the done contemporary at the same time with the same strain, you go from a hazard ratio of 0.37 in the observational data to a hazard ratio of 1.06. In other words, the observational study of molnar pirivir is so distorted Healthier, richer, well-connected people are getting molnupiravir, and poorer, uh, less fortunate people are not getting molnupiravir. And it's not the molnupiravir creating the difference in the observational study. It's the confounding that you haven't resolved. And proof of that is the randomized study, which eliminates that confounding, has no point estimate. So that's how much that melts away. Imagine what's going to happen to Paxlovid when we actually get the panoramic randomized study. The other problem is something that Mani Moyudin and I wrote about in JAM Internal Medicine called Detecting Selection Bias in Observational Studies when interventions work too fast. And what we mean is that sometimes, if you're not a good reader of the literature, like this person, when the curves split immediately, you don't realize that there's a bias present, but you actually think it's plausible that there's some difference. He writes, a real world effective study documents an 85% reduction in death for Paxlovid independent of vaccination status. But look at those curves. The curves split before you even take Paxlovid. How could it work on day zero? The curve split on day zero. You have to be deranged to think Paxlovid can work before you take it. The only difference is that there's one guarantee time. In other words, to be in the Paxlovid arm, you couldn't have been hospitalized before you went to the pharmacy. That's a guaranteed time or an immortal time, only prevalent in one group and not the other. And it is always a product of observational data that retrospectively apply labels to people. And to be in one group, you have to have stayed out of the hospital or not had the event for a certain period of time. That's called guarantee time. The other problem is it's also confounded that the people who get packs of it in the real world are different than the people who don't. Are we kidding ourselves? They're richer, more well-connected, more worried about their health, et cetera, et cetera. There may be other differences. This is not a pure Paxlovid effect. The curve split immediately in these things. That is, get, what am I to think? If you, do not re, if, you, if you cannot read a paper and understand that this means there's a problem, you shouldn't be interpreting medical science. So bottom line about Paxlovid, we have given test ma- or bottom line tests, we've given the test makers and Pfizer billions of dollars in government handouts. It's a welfare program for these people. Private insurers are paying billions of dollars. These companies have never demonstrated that testing improves outcomes in any context. No one has ever shown that a high risk person in 2023 with prevailing strains who've already gotten a couple shots in their arm and may have had COVID before will benefit from Paxlovid. The company has failed that obligation. More testing in medicine does not always improve outcomes. Often, it erodes outcomes. The solution really is that if you actually cared about people, you would try to push for some paid sick leave with some provisions about not letting people game it. But only a fool, a total public health fool, would push for testing rather than paid sick leave. It speaks so poorly of public health as an institution. So those are my thoughts. All right, well. That was the, uh, that's the slide for hours. When I give talks in real world, I say, if you like this, you could check out my sub stack or you could go to sensible medicine or you could go to blah, 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 blah. But you all know that you listen to my channel. So that was the gist of it. That's the gist of my argument that testing makes no sense. I mean, it's not only that it could be null, it's that it could actually be deleterious and there, no one has proven otherwise. I think it's crazy to do it. It's crazy to recommend it. It's crazy to give people billions of dollars and not have accountability. It is a giveaway. This is, not con- this is not consistent with medicine. You don't test someone unless you can take action. In this case, you can't take action because there's no good data for Paxlovid. That's always been the rules of medicine. We have been, unfortunately, our brains have been hijacked in medicine by people who don't know anything. And those people, unfortunately, are running the show. But eventually, it's going to be the emperor's new clothes will be shown to all. Okay, so... If you like this video, you know what to do. Like, subscribe, comment, leave a message below. Um, reach out with any topics you want me to cover in the future. I'm probably going to do some more critical appraisal of oncology stuff. I've got some really good lecture videos that I hope get produced well and that they send me so I can post them to you, some talks I've been giving. And I'll be back with uh, more content here. And then check out the Substacks and check out Sensible Medicine and the Sensible Medicine Podcast and Plenary Session Podcast. Got a lot of stuff coming there. So until next time.